shy. <laughs> no, actually, the, the we'll get better fidelity out of it. There we go. I know that place. Um, it's on. It's it's genuinely a pleasure to be here. I live in Murrieta, so I'm close by. As she said, I'm a high school teacher, so I love to see our youth achieving in uh, UCLA. That's where my dad wanted me to go to school. I failed him. Um, and our young gentleman that's going to major in uh, history, good for you, sir. Uh, historical societies are going to need you uh, down the line. But uh, when I was in high school, I didn't like history. I really didn't. Um, and then, what do you know, I became a historian. And uh, the, folks at, the good folks at Pechanga call me a rock art historian. So I guess I'm a historian, but I love history. And I've, been, I've had the privilege of speaking to organizations throughout the Southwest. It's nice to speak in the back, my backyard. I have given talks to, uh, well, people in Arizona with an audience of one, with a large statue of Elvis behind me. <laughs> I gave a talk at one of the uh, native uh, uh, gardens in uh, Orange County in a barn with chickens and goats running between the audience. So this is a refreshing change. I like this. Um, by the way, because I'm a teacher, um, I kind of do this in more of a professorial method. So I have the notes of this lecture are in this book, and it's for sale, and there's no tax. So what do you know? That's wonderful. Well, let's get started. Um, my principal focus over the years has been Southern California. Can you all hear me OK? Yes. All right, good, because they told me to speak loud. Uh, the, um, but my focus has been Southern California for the longest time. Now I have four research projects going on in the lower Colorado desert, south of Palm Springs. And in my spare time in the summers and in you know, holidays, we would go to the Grand Canyon and donated over 10,000 hours to the recording of rock art, the preservation of prehistoric and historic features in the Grand Canyon. And it culminated in this book. But I can say that even now, in 2019, my, my friends, or my, I call them my team and I, have discovered 18 brand new rock art loces that have never been described before. And yet, we're, so the point is we're continuing to make discoveries. It's rather fascinating, and I've been privileged to work on the largest intact Mexican land grant is currently in Southern California, Rancho Guajito, and have discovered several new rock art sites there. By the way, it's a small piece of property, about 34 square miles, uh, and it exists near, near the Wild Animal Park, and most people don't even know of its existence because of all the roads navigate around the plateau that it exists on, so it's rather fascinating. I have published on it, I'll be publishing seven more articles on it, including a couple analytical designs uh, regarding some of the cultural uh, artifact array that we find there. So it's been quite a life journey from going from someone who didn't really care for the uh, historic aspects to it's become my full-time passion. But I'm here to talk about the rock art of the Grand Canyon. Let's get started. This is the first day that the book arrived at my house. I was rather excited, so I poured myself some Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the high school students. Um, my, author, my authorship team, we had a senior researcher. His name was Don Christensen. Don is a retired AP US history teacher of high school, but he's a phenomenal archaeologist. Uh, Jerry Dickey, who is doing work currently on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And uh, myself, and I get rather creative with tripod placement. A few facts about the Grand Canyon. It is almost 2,000 square miles. It's a large, large property or management issue, actually. It gets about 4 million tourists annually, but only 10%, roughly, has been archaeologically surveyed. That means there's 90% of the canyon that has not been uh, investigated to any degree for evidence of early folks. And we have recorded, it's actually not 510, it's 542 now, uh, because we keep, we keep doing new uh, work in the area. The book, though, represents about 24 years of our findings. In fact, we had no intention of publishing a book. And to be perfectly honest with you folks, um, I kind of grew a little um, uneasy with the prospect of publishing. 
but because we partnered with the Grand Canyon itself, the National Park System, the Forest Service, the BLM, and the, North, the Paiute uh, Band, uh, we felt okay about going because they wanted us to publish the book rather than have somebody else exploiting the resources in an unjuried uh, way. And so we felt really good from the ethical perspective of publishing this book. And all groups, all stakeholders had a chance to review it and basically uh, sanctify it in their view. Interestingly, we had to leave out several of the more interesting places because of that vetting. But we, again, we feel good about what we've done. The Grand Canyon, uh, I would imagine most of you have been there. Raise your hand if you have not. Okay, get started. Yeah. But trust me, it's, it's worth it. Um, the Grand Canyon is a quite varied landscape from the river itself to the forest. This happened, by the way, in Arizona, they call these areas where there's sort of clearings, they call them parks, not meadows. Kind of interesting nomenclature. But that's what it looks like, and a lot of people don't realize the Grand Canyon has one of the largest ponderosa pine forests in the United States. It's really beautiful. Most people, though, are gandering into the canyon or looking down, short little visit stops. But when you get off the main plateau, which is a big block of limestone, and you get lower into the sandstone reaches of the Grand Canyon, this is where some of the really early expressions from people who live, this, live in this area are uh, place. Sometimes these expressions go back 3,000 years. Um, dramatic weather, particularly in the summer, as we're entering into the monsoonal season, and it can be really daunting at times, but also spectacular atmospherically. And of course, you have to watch where you're stepping, especially this year. If you, I've had two rattlesnakes in my yard already this year, so it, it's problematic. Fortunately, this one was sleeping and let me walk by. It's interesting we have hiked into the most remote areas of the Grand Canyon, and yet we'll find evidence of early mining. The, the spirit of the people who were trying to exploit, exploit the resources of the Grand Canyon really known, knew no bounds. In fact, we found a small mining operation that was operated by two brothers around 1908. They were trying to extract copper ore. They owned eight mules. They would pack up those eight mules with copper ore, um, I guess trek about 74 miles to Kanab to have their ores assayed for about three bucks. And this is how they made their life for about 11 years. So in other words, they went through a lot to eke out a living, but they certainly were hardy individuals, right? We find evidence of saddles. This happens to be a roping saddle kind of on the decorator side from about 1943. Mentholatum jars, the old school mentholatum jars filled with decomposing aspirin and all sorts of stuff. It's wild what we find. However, this is how most people see the canyon. This is actually not how I see the canyon. I rarely go to the touristy areas. That happens to be the El Tovar Hotel. But this is how most people see it. It's beautiful at night. When doing the research for my book, they allowed me to go in and look at the artifacts, and I did a lot of photography for the GRCA. That's how they formally designate federally the Grand Canyon, the GRCA. But we, I went into their archives and was doing a lot of work, looking at old photographs, and I fell in love with this picture. has nothing to do with rock art, but I put it in the book anyway because I fell in love with it. That's Doris Dunn in 1929. It's just showing how the many different ways human beings have interacted with the environs of the Grand Canyon. It's, been, it's quite beautiful. Okay, let's get to some rock art. Rock art is kind of a catch-all term for artistic, or artistic's a bad word, interactions that take the form of artistic designs on the landscape by Native Americans. And they can take the form of many ways. Petroglyphs, those are the peckings in the rocks that take away the exterior patinated coating to leave the lighter colored rock in the underneath. Those are called petroglyphs. Paintings, geoglyphs, there's many different types of rock art. Here's some paintings. This happens to be called Michigan Tank, which I'll be visiting in a couple weeks, actually. And some of the art is rather spectacular. I got a phone call two years ago by someone up in Boyle Heights, and they said, Mr. Frears, we'd like to, do, we'd like to interview you. I've done many interviews, and I thought, oh, okay, I, I'm interested. But he was coy, very coy about what he wanted. 
And he said, well, it's for a television show. And of course I go, ooh, neato. But he wouldn't tell me. And he said, we'd like to come down and talk to you. So I went to Santa Monica and interviewed with the cameras and everything. And I, and I said, well, what, what program is this? Well, it's on the History Channel. Okay. Which, which show? So I had to, pulling teeth, well, it's Ancient Aliens. And I thought to myself, you know, no, I'm not going to play. I got in my car and drove home. So. Because they'll want you to believe that this is alien beings from another planet, and they wanted somebody to be their foil, so their quasi-expert could poke out. No, this was done by Native American artists, the, an archaic people, two to 3,000 years ago. And yes, it's visually expressive. You can look at this. That one, the one that has, looks like two stubby arms actually has eyelashes. It is extraordinary from the wells of the mo human mind, some of the expressions that we see. What they mean, we don't know. We can speculate, and I, and I don't do that. I let the audience make their own decisions. But we, we can look at it as objectively as possible. And so we'll, I'll show you more about these type of expressions. But this is the mystery of this is what attracts people. Why did they make these? Why are they placed here? Everybody asks what they mean, when. We don't have those answers yet, but we can describe them and show you their occurrence frequency and what we do know about these images. And let's get started. I have a timeline for you. And this will give you a general sense of the phases of rock art that we have, we have uh, denoted in our study in collaboration with the archaeologists that are professionally working in the field. So this timeline goes way back. It actually extends far, farther now, 12,000 years. But the first, oh, the first 5,000 years, we don't see any rock art evidence, nothing that's been corroborated by scientific study. But then after about 3,500 years, from 5,000 to 3,000 years before Christ or B.C., we have a tradition we call the Western Rock Archaic Tradition, or the Western Archaic Tradition. That just means it's something that's pervasive throughout the Western United States, and we see these things every, everywhere from near Palm Springs to the Great Basin, out into the plains, this archaic type of rock art. And then after that, we get many more specific styles as people of the Americas started to organize into larger groups, large, larger hunter and gathering groups, such as these I have listed here, and I'll show you examples of all those. And as we get closer to the present, that's when people started, like horticulture, they started developing more communal societies, building permanent structures, and the society started to develop. And you, those of you familiar with the, the, the Southwest, will say, understand like basket maker culture progressed to Puebloan and so forth. And so we have rock art styles that seem to align, or rock art occurrences that align with this progression of human development in North America, leading all the way up into historic times, proto-historic rock art and even historic rock art. Let's look at the older stuff. And by the way, what's interesting, some of the older stuff, if I can use that term, is some of the most artistically flamboyant and, and spectacular. And so let's take a look. We'll start with the more uh, simple. This is what we call non-representative rock art. It doesn't smack of anything specific. And it's rather old. If you happen to look and you see the, the spirals there, they have achieved the same color as the exterior of the rock. That tells us it has a lot of time de depth. In other words, the designs have repatinated to the same level as the surrounding rock. And this is non-representational Western archaic. These are petroglyphs, by the way, made by pecking the rock. You'll see fresher, if you will, examples later. And some of them could be easily missed. If you're walking in a stream bed, you could walk right by this and not really notice it. So kind of training your eye to look for these discrepancies in the natural rock allows you to kind of pick these things up. Then we have our, our, our archaic rock art. This was actually developed by a gentleman named Christy Turner. Do you remember when, or you may not remember when, but 
Have you heard of the Glen Canyon Dam? Well, before it was a dam, you know, it was just the Colorado River, and Glen Canyon was inundated when they built the Glen Canyon Dam. Prior to that, a gentleman had done a lot of the archaeological mitigation for that project and came up with a style of rock art called Glen Canyon Linear and seemed to have confirmation that it dated back into the archaic period. What you see with this type of rock art is human-like figures. The term we use is anthropomorph. It's human-like. And then there's figures <coughs> called zoomorphs or zoomorphs, which are animal-like. And they often have crosses in their inter interiors. That seemed to be a thread that was hanging this particular expression together. So it's called Glen Canyon Linear. There's an example. And you can see how the petroglyph itself is the same color as the rock patination. That tells you it's really old because if it was fresh, all those lines would be rather white. You can see down below some of the actual color of the rock that's weathered away. Very interesting designs. There is a Glen Canyon 5 sheep. Little stubby legs. But it's interesting how groups had this common expression, a stylization, if you will. It's an overused word, but style tells us something that hangs together conceptually looks like it was made by the same individual, cultural group, or whatever. Now, there's a style that's really idiosyncratic to the Grand Canyon area itself. There's a town called Tucson in the south rim of the Grand Canyon. It's what you normally enter if you're coming up from Flagstaff or Williams. You go through Tucson, and they named a rock art style after this. These are painted uh, images that are rather interesting. Let's take a look. Many times you'll see, uh, by the way, the Grand Canyon is pretty much limestone on the upper parts of the Grand Canyon, and these sites are very small, tucked under these shelves of limestone that extrude out from the bedrock and on the undersurface where there's some flat areas. And there's Don crammed in there. And you can see a little bit of the art in the ceiling. I'll give you a picture, a little picture. And look how delicate those designs. These are painted designs, this Tucson style, and, and they favored for the small work a little brush, like a yucca fiber brush, to make fine lines, as well as the primary painting tool for Native American artists was their own finger. And so the, a, a finger was used to create that concentric spoke wheel and the other designs. So this is really interesting to the Tucson style. Steve, what kind of paint would they use that it's still they would use They would use iron oxides primarily. So iron three oxide, which has that reddish tone when it's heated up. And it's, there's a debate now how much they actually used a binding agent in their paint. Now the binding agent could be many different organic things. Everything from urine to sap to the oils of some plants. Locally, they use the chilicote plant, the wild cucumber, use the oil from that. It makes a beautiful paint binder, and it really helps the indelible uh, nature of the art. But these are mostly iron oxides, and depending on how much they were preheated or the quality or source of the iron oxide can shift it from a fairly bright red to a maroon color. And we have mostly the maroon colors in the Grand Canyon for that. Did that answer your question? Okay. You're very welcome. Now, one thing that's typical about archaic, and again, when I use that term, we're talking something that's 2,000 or more years ago, or 1,500 to 3,000 years, is they, they commonly had sheep, like a big horn sheep expression in their art, and their anthropomorphs usually had head imp uh, ornamentation, um, they could be genderized, they could be a phallus or other, other um, gender identification on them. And this, notice how they exaggerate the body with itty bitty little feet. And that's a common thing of the Tucson style. Now, digital photography has been a boon to rock art. Remember I mentioned we found 18 brand new sites just this year already and counting. One of the ways we're doing it is using digital photography and then amplifying the colors so what looks like a blank surface, suddenly images appear. And it's been a boon to those of us interested in rock art and conservation. 
Now you can barely see somewhat of a painting there. Watch what happens when you digitally enhance it. It used to be we had to take the photographs in the Grand Canyon, drive home, put them on our computers, and oh, I missed one. But now we can do it in the field with our iPhones, our iPads, instantly. And it's really increased the rate. And I can hook it into my GIS and locate it. Now, by the way, cell phones have been the bane of cultural resources. So Some of you might be aware of this because people, you know, they take their selfie, it has... Uh, geolocating data embedded in the file, they put it on Facebook, now the world knows. And we're really concerned about that. So we're very careful about that. Um, right above the site, which you can't see, is a bus stop. And we recorded this for the National Park Service about 18 years ago with people right above and had no idea we're there. And the Grand Canyon doesn't want people to know it's there. But they're right above us, so we have to be very quiet sometimes in the high traffic areas. But this is some of the arts in there. Now, if you'll notice, I'll just walk over here. The, the lighter colored things are petroglyphs. So they, someone has gone in and pet over the paintings that are older. And we start seeing this superpositioning of imagery gives us another sense of in what sequence this art occurs. So they call that temporal placement uh, by looking at superpositioning. If you look at that dot, that's a, you know, kind of like a pointillistic or a dot figure with little hands. Fascinating the way they chose to express human-like or spirits that have kind of these interesting bodies. You'll see more of that in a bit. And also some things that are reminiscent. For example, on the right, you see what looks like maybe a bighorn sheep or something along those lines. But what it really looks like is a split twig figurine. What the Grand Canyon is noted, and these perishable artifacts have been found in the caves and carbon dated, and we have a sense of when these were made. This is an actual split twig figurine, about 1,250 years old from the museum. They let me photograph. And then some of the art is so small. There's a comparison. And then some of the art is bigger than I am. Nine feet tall is the largest anthropomorph. Just been fantastic. Um, here's, a, here's an example. It's not just cave shelters. You can walk uh, two to seven kilometers along a limestone uh, outcrop and see no cultural evidence, and suddenly there'll be a little spall, and right in a minute, right in the middle, a gorgeous painting. These are those serendipitous finds that are so exciting and just so cute, and we call this one sweet sheep because it was so sweet to find. <laughs> and if you notice, you see the rock is cracking, and at some point the rock cycle does its thing, and these, these paintings will go away as part of the natural course uh, of time. That's an archaic sheet. But notice the detail, knobby knees, the little hooves that they do that, with these little C's. Beautiful detail for such a remote image remote by our standards. One style that really got the National Geographic really excited, and I did a pioneering trip into the Grand Canyon that was antecedent to the National Geographic coming in and doing a little expose on this art, is the Esplanade style. The Esplanade is a sandstone bench below the top of the Grand Canyon, and it seems to be a place where archaic peoples gravitated to to do ceremony. We think those ceremonies revolved around agave, where they would gather and roast it, because we find a lot of agave mounds and a lot of midden near these sites that suggest that archaic peoples, this was an active part of these paintings uh, processes, the Esplanade style. What you'll notice about these images, what's so idiosyncratic about them, they're usually long, wavy, tapered, human-like forms, anthropomorphs, with itty bitty little legs, little heads, and long elaborated bodies. Very psychedelic, very trans like. That's the Esplanade. I'm actually standing on the top of the Grand Canyon where you might stand if you go to Sowats Point, and that's looking out at the Esplanade, that light colored sandstone. 
And that's where they were going. It's at the head of those drainages that we find a lot of this. There's, one, there's some of my crew. They're happy. They're happy because we hiked down this to get there. And then we camp. That's why my knees are so bad. That's our camp. Oh my God, is it beautiful. If you want to get away from it all, there you go. But that's the es we're on the Esplanade Formation there. We know where we've mapped all the water, uh, common water holes and tanahas where water accumulates, both in the monsoon season and in the spring, so that we can go upwards of 60 miles out there and we know where the water's going to be. If there's no water and we have critic, we cache it as we go, if so that we can get back if we get skunked on water. So you have to be very disciplined and organized to do this safely. There's an example of a spring. This is Maidenhair Spring. There are very, 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 that's very, for our high school students, that's very to the third power, <laughs> few potable springs in this area of the Grand Canyon. Water is so precious and scarce that you kind of wonder how ancient peoples managed. But when you can find it as potable, oftentimes it's highly alkali. It'll give you the squirts, as the old timers will say. Um, <laughs> That's made in here spring. And there's my buddy with the water balls. He had to climb up into the cliffs, and he just waits till the bottle fills up. But that's how we get our, some one way we get our water. Those are maidenhair ferns that you see gracing. That's why it's called maidenhair spring. Oh, yes, that's the uh, water. Thank you very much. You're here to see rock art, so let's get to the uh, beautiful part. There's Kyle looking at some wonderful rock mm -hmm. art. That's to, that, was to, that slides to remind me to tell you about the agave. But I already told you about that. <laughs> so this particular rock art site we call Atlas Shrugs. Atlas Shrugs. You know who Atlas was, right? Not the guy with the gems and all that, but I'm talking about the ancient Atlas. <clears throat> That's why we call it Atlas Shrugs, because Atlas has got the earth or the world up on his hands. And interesting, in this archaic form, we see a lot of what we call Canaan motifs. That means dog-like. And there's a lot of dog-like creatures that are very attendant, like attendant figures, in archaic rock art in the Southwest. So you can speculate about that relationship even back then with humans and animals such as dogs. What does that look like to you? Go figure, right? Grand Canyon. That kind of shows you that some of this, you know, we don't know if there's cause and effect or if actually seeing an animal of that nature influenced the drawing or this is just from the wellspring of human imagination. But you can see how friable the art is. It's flaking away over time. We have to be extraordinarily careful. We take off our hat. You can't touch the art. You can't even touch the rock near the art because it could spall away. And unfortunately, we worry about visitation because visitors don't have the same sensitivity or discipline and we could literally love these things to death. So we keep these all secret. You'll notice in the book if you choose to get one, no locations are revealed. It's all kept secret. And it's beautiful to hike there. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. How about that element array? Isn't that spectacular? We speculate. We have not carbon dated this for a couple reasons because the Paiutes asked us not to. But we, um, this dates back, we believe, 1800 to 2500, or 1800 to 2500 years. It's fantastic. It's called Panther Cave. I, I'm allowed to show you, but I couldn't put it in the book. Uh, they just asked me not to. But they said you can lecture on it because people aren't taking the images and spreading them. But that's, it's the panther because doesn't that head look like cat-like? Whiskers? Isn't that amazing? That people in America were making... Oh, please don't take pictures of those. Oh, okay. Thank you. Please don't do that. I should have said something. My bad. That was my fault. There's a close-up. So this, the, the panther, and then we have s spirit beings with two heads or multiple heads, bird-like and, and cat-like figures, or we call them feline motifs. There's me um, getting, getting, doing the pilot work for the National Geographic. 
I'm also taking the, the cover of the book. There's the picture there. That's the site. Uh, that's Rick Burry looking at the site. And believe it or not, that shadowed area, you can see the stacks of sandstone above. This is the Esplanade Formation. You can actually stand in that, in that shelter. And it could probably hold 20 or 30 people. It's really a, a, a wonderful shelter cave. And that's some of the imagery on there. Now, I'm going to leave this up for a minute so you're, you get a chance to take in the imagery. This is such a striking image. Um, not only do you have, well, some of you will notice there's one, two, three, four, five beams, but one is upside down. And you can do, you can think about what that could possibly mean. But what's interesting is this one in particular I find fascinating. Um, I'm also an anatomist. I majored in several subjects, but it looks like human anatomy. I did a comparison of this image, or some of this imagery, with the drawings of Galen, people from Egypt and India back in the... How did, how did early people perceive human anatomy? Strong parallels, because you can only pre, pre, uh, perceive so much with crude dissection or whatever happens. I won't get into that. It's ra rather fascinating. There's the head, and notice... There's bilateral arterial supply, possibly. Goes into the head. We call that the you know, mesentery and so forth. Very interesting, but these are so wonderfully detailed and quite old. How large are those? Um, a good question. Those, um, probably, I'll use feet. I'm so used to meters, but um, probably three and a half to four feet long each. So they're rather substantial in size, which means they needed a lot a high pigment supply. What's particularly problematic with painted art that goes back into time is that certain color types, meaning certain mineral types, are more soluble in water and weather away quickly. White pigments are we call the most fugitive. That means they weather away quickly. Then black pigment, and then is... The most hardy are our reds. So to, to find red and white pigment, pigments usually will inform you that it's either extremely well protected or it's rather recent. Now in this case, it's extremely well protected. It's deep in that cave. And there's no active fissuring in sandstone. What's interesting about limestone, those of you know geologically, limestone fissures and cracks very easily. It becomes rather porous. And so rock art on limestone can easily be obliterated by molds and all the, the deleterious effects of drainage, whereas sandstones are more stable in terms of fissuring. And so you, they can be protected for hundreds, if not thousands of years, as evidence of this, from seeping through the rock. And so the, it, it's one of those things that lends to its preservation. And that I, I love that. It has like balloon animal. I know. And with eyes and multicolored or polychromatic streaks coming down from the eyes, fascinating imagery. This is one long anthropomorph that has that windswept deformity, we call it, that windstep with little small legs, actually has a little phallus that it doesn't really show. That image is seven and a half feet long. I could, it's my 16 millimeter lens, I could barely capture the whole thing. Two heads are better than one. And just <laughs> wonderful and wonderfully mysterious, right? That's Rick Berry next to a phalange. You see that phalange of uh, sandstone? You can crawl underneath at your own risk. They call this cave of birds. And there's a lot of little bird motifs in there. There's one. There's actually a couple birds. Um, you see this long, big one with the big wing structure, and then that smaller one up there. Um, I didn't include too many pictures, so you get the point. This happens to be probably the most uh, famous of the Esplanade-style sites. This is called Shaman's Gallery, um, discovered by Mary Allen, who's unfortunately passed away. She had breast cancer. But she was a river guide, and she uh, told the world about this has a well over 120 feet of continuous art. It runs, well actually the length of this building if not farther, of these type of designs. 
and they just go on and on. It's it's a visual. It's visually dazzling. Um, the ancient aliens people were particularly interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> and look at these schematicized anthropomorphs, or we suspect just a very simple simplified head, a long tapering, kind of rectilinear body. It's just really interesting. There's the one with eyelashes. Isn't it, you know, and people will have all sorts of comments about that, and that's fine. But no one knows. No one knows what this means. But it's just, it's flat out, wonder, it's wonderful and mysterious. And that, that green is true to the actual col color. There is a copper, little copper, uh, it was mined for, by those two guys I told you about earlier in the area, and they were able to make green pigment out of that. Little sun-like designs. I say sun-like only as a descriptor, not as a definer, you know, just to let you know. Now, here's this, this is called jump up. Sometimes in these archaic places, the floor has collapsed. The floor was probably up here at one time. The arch there, there's Don. We call it jump up. Way up on the top of a shelter, this is, a, this is where the shelter is located, right there where I'm showing you, this is looking across the canyon. And I'm looking from the canyon bottom in the arch, right dead center in the screen, where the arrow is. And then there's a close-up. Now that's abstract art, but it's archaic and it's different. So abstract meaning there's no zoomorphs or anthropomorphs, but beautifully rendered. One thing interesting too, I was I had my telephoto lens this day, and I noticed they pre-marked using the mineral, the dry mineral, and uh, scratching out the design, and then painted it. So this was be, this was deliberate. Many times you don't know if it's just however the design comes out, it's serendipitous. But to pre-plan your design by taking the the dry pigment like a pigment stick and dragging it and then painting. So quite deliberate, which means it has importance and certainly some potency spiritually perhaps. This one's called Candyman. How many have ever went to Knott's Berry Farm back in the day? Did they have those big lollipops when you were there? Well, we call this one, this site, looking out of it, that's looking out from the inside. Call it Candyman. We call it Candyman because they have little arms and legs. So, I just love those. My parents never bought me one of those lines. I am scarred for life. And it, it, these archaic places have these beautiful little sheep, and they dance. And they behave that way. If you ever watch the behavior of Bighorn in particular, um, they do that. It's part of their mating or their courting ritual. That's the green. Isn't that beautiful? That's the green paint. That's a, that's a copper-based malachite paint. And so it's probably from one of the copper um, little ore sources they have. Which they'll, the ancient peoples love to carry little bits of pigment and stuff with them. And they would gather these and they would for the purpose of when it was the ceremonial time or the time that they want to celebrate or paint visions or express, they would have the pigment sources available. And so that I can see how that was highly attractive. Excuse me. Would they ever use blood or do you know? We don't know. One way to find that, obviously, is to do some radiocarbon dating and some, mm -hmm. you know, but they did an amino acid racemization study once, which means they look for the amino acids in the binders and stuff and they didn't pick up any blood. That would have shown up for sure. Okay. But there is, you can look at the ethnography, blood, urine, the, the, the blood, the, uh, from the placenta for after birth. Mm -hmm. They've used all sorts of things in certain ceremonial constructs around the world. But you can't take what they did in Siberia and say this is what they did here. You can, you can speculate and then test the hypothesis, but no one knows. Notice, remember I mentioned those attendant figures? like that little canid motif right here. I rather doubt that's supposed to be a mountain lion, so that wouldn't work out too well. 
Are you enjoying this? Yes. Yeah. Isn't this fascinating? Yeah. yeah, okay. I'm just looking at my time. I have a history of going long, but they're going to keep me from, so I won't hold you hostage, I promise. All right, let's look at some other cool stuff. How about in a later period, we call this the pre-formative and the formative period. This is basically when people started the, uh, the formative aspects of, of horticulture. They began some sedentary living, maybe pit houses and so forth. And so this is where we get the basket makers, the people that were starting to make baskets. This was a precept actually started by a, I call him a grave robber, Richard Weatherwell, uh, Weatherwell around Mesa Verde. If you haven't been to Mesa Verde, make, put that on your bucket list. That's a must thing to do. So let's take a look at the basket makers. This happens to be the only basket in possession at the Grand Canyon in their, in their resources. This is a basket maker basket. And they just handed it to me. I was freaked out. I've, I had latex gloves, the whole thing, and they just gave it to me. So I was very gentle. This happens to be Snake Gulch. It is aptly named. I'm telling you where it is because it is permissible. It is monitored for you to go there. So this is on the northern rim of the Grand Canyon. It has a broad valley. You can see the path. The walking is easy, but it's long. But at least the walking is easy if you have the endurance to go 8 to 10 miles round trip. <laughs> and no, do you see a distinct difference in the art of this period? G gone are those wispy, willowy figures. The white that you perceive on this rock art is not paint. It was scratched away. So that's not paint. The red is, but this is a combination kind of like they pre-prepped and smoothed out the area between the legs and then in the head area. There is an anthropomorph. I'm trying to get a picture because I, I saw a handprint. I measure handprints and do gender uh, stature studies. And it's kind of high up there. Oh, Don stood back so he can get a picture. If I fell, <laughs> he would be able to capture the moment. <laughs> this is Snake Gulch. I told you. I call this, forgive my language, I call this the hissy, pissy snake of Snake Gulch. Because I said, Don goes, Steve, you have a friend coming. And I go, what? He goes, you have a friend coming. I turned around, and that was him. He was coming right at me. He, he veered off to the right, went between my tripod, and struck my backpack, <laughs> making a statement. Yes. <laughs> then he weaves into my backpack, which he stayed for 20, 25 minutes, while I was wondering, how can I do this and not upset him anymore? <laughs> so anyway... Um, here's some more of the anthropomorph, just showing you the beautiful variety of rock art expressions. Remember, we're really celebrating here. We're celebrating the human being, the human expression, and how varied and intriguing it is. It's just, it's just uh, remarkable. There's a yellow ochre image right there in the middle. A lot of these have those hair bobs or hair whirls, you know, the Princess Leia thing <laughs> going on. I, I include this sign, this slide, because one of the reasons why it, most all groups agree that these need to be recorded, because they are leaving us because of the rock cycle and fracturing, and you can see how precarious those images are. There's one that fell completely. With the help of the National Forest Service, we picked it up and set it against the, uh, uh, the archaeologist, Neil Weintraub. But those happen to be, we believe, we don't interpret much, but we believe those actually to be turkeys because there's a lot of that type of bird. looks like a walking, large walking uh, bird. And the head is more fugitive. We say fugitive, it's wearing away or weathering away faster. I should mention that mineral pigments do not fade. They weather away. Vegetable 
pigments or organic pigments will fade over time. So just to make sure. So the, that, that pigment they use for the head and legs is weathering. And many times people will hike in the southwest and just see these bodies and kind of wonder, what is that? Well, parts of it have weathered away that they use a different pigment for. Here's the cave valley variant of this rock. We call it transitional. Transitional means from hunter and gathering strategies to more setism and a horticulture and developing societies and governments and all the problems they're in, right? <laughs> And look how demonstrative angled these are. Gone are those curvy linear designs. This is called Cave Valley. By the way, the type site for Cave Valley is in Zion National Park, and it's a protected site. And we're just finishing up a huge study, 57 archaeological sites in Zion right now. More, and this beautiful painted expressions. Look at the greenish tin there. Isn't that cool? Some of you have heard of Coca Pelli. Who is Coca Pelli? Or is the Hopi say Coca Pelu? That's the flute player. Yeah. Just showing you the, the, the beautiful variety of colors. We don't see that palette of color in uh, our Native American paintings in Southern California. This is something that mostly here is the reds, a little bit of black, very rarely white. But in the Grand Canyon, where they have more access to the metals like copper and so forth that can provide these different, for those chemists out there, the oxidation levels that give you the different colors and the transition levels, we get those. How about this? This, you are looking at a very important cave to the Paiute. This happens to be a volcanic lava tube, and it's collapsed. And if, if, I, if I can take, you mind if I take you in there? Please. It's, it's my high school drama thing coming out. <laughs> Do you want me to show you the experiment that blows up? No, we won't. <laughs> but this is inside, this is inside the lava tube, and it is so protected, and it's wonderful in the summer because it's about 60 degrees in there all the time. But look how bright and vivid the pigments are. I'm showing you this because this is probably the, how vivid the rock art, or as close as we can show you how vivid the rock art expressions were before the effects of weathering and so forth. Just beautiful. Look how bright. And then the finger was the, the applicator for this art. There's some mineral, that's mineral drainage on, off to the right. And a little rainbow. And you can even see where the paint was kind of, just kind of dripped down a little bit. It has a fresh aspect. But we don't believe it's recent. We actually believe it dates back probably to around 800 A.D. And... I'm wrapping up. We're, we still have 16 minutes to go before I get the hook. <laughs> Ancestral Puebloan. That's a, they, um, that is the preferred term now for the early Puebloan groups. And just to give you an idea, there's a map of the, of the area of the plateaus and the river. Of course, the Colorado River courses through there on its path. It has several tributaries. That's the Perea River, or Kanab Creek, excuse me. Kanab Creek was a wonderful corridor. It starts around Fredonia, Kanab area, for those of you who've gone out that way, and then goes all the way down and right in the canyon. I've hiked the whole thing. It's phenomenal. Um, we have the Little Colorado River up, up there, the Perea, um, where up the north parts were uh, the outlaw Josie Wales was filmed. The Virgin River. And some of the groups that lived in these areas were named after these tributaries and so forth. Um, also the plateau. The star is where Grand Canyon Village is. 
The Virgin is named after the Virgin River, but that was a, a group, a segment of ancestral Puebloan that had distinctively distinctive artifact um, evidence as well as paintings. Then there's the Cayenta, and the Cayenta and the Cojonina, they kind of blended. They blended their traditions and their expressions, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But so there's three different types of these ancestral Puebloan groups that have noticeably different rock art techniques and characteristics. So looking at the Cojonina, you're looking at some paintings of their style, and notice this becomes a little bit more parsimonious. In other words, a little bit more frugal in the way they conduct their designs, more schematic, not as elaborated as we saw in the more archaic forms of rock art. The Kohanina were really known for a lot of building of forts, a lot of fortification structures. This has a very clever name, this area. This is called Fort Hill. <laughs> I've mastered the obvious. You're looking at a very special place that is kept secret, but I'm allowed to show you. This happens to be called Wall of Voodoo. It's called Wall of Voodoo because there's a lot of these, I don't know why the voodoo thing, but there's a lot of collapsed walls, and they've actually been able to map out um, ball courts, large kivas, ceremonial squares, um, and lots of room structures. It's a gigantic site, but if you were to walk there and you have an untrained eye, you might not, all you see is a bunch of rocks in the forest, but it's, it's a gigantic village. Nearby are some of these petroglyphs, and notice how bright and fresh they look compared to the ones where the dark minerals have begun to reform on the rock art. So what you're looking at, that's closer to the actual color of the parent rock. In fact, here's a recent spall, and you can see this light gray tone. That's what the rock's real color is. But the, this is starting to repatinate, but over the, over the eons, or the period of large spans of time, manganese and other minerals seep to the surface and form this patina. So it's, it's pecked away. These are petroglyphs. But you can see the, the beings are a little bit more simplistic, but at the same time, not as spirit-like, if you'd like, at least in terms of the wispiness and the, the length. That's probably a poor term, spirit -like. What does that look like? A crab or a, or a tick or, you know. So it looks like insecta, doesn't it, of some type. There, we, the, the, the Paiute name for this, believe it or not, the yellow stuff, is, it's, it's the, the interpretation is lizard semen. That's what they call this um, yellow uh, stuff. There is snake-like, snake-like motifs. Again, not to be too. Isn't that a beautiful little anthropomorph? Much different in style. Some of our young, our high school students. You're getting an adult lecture here. Um, some of the high school students would recognize cat dog, right? I'm sorry, this audience doesn't know about cat dog. <laughs> But you can see it's almost like the tail, a whole contiguous circle with this anthropomorph. It's just very intriguing, and you can have fun descri describing it and so forth. This is a Michigan tank again. I showed you some of this earlier. The Kohunina made lots of small motifs that have somewhat realistic form, like I showed you insecta, maybe like a, a, a mountain lion or something that looks like that with some otherworldly characteristics. This, this, these are all painted forms, again, in that more maroon type of pigment. Notice at the very top, there's, a, there's an ochred handprint. And that happens to be a right hand. With the, and there's what we call a negative handprint. So what, one is just an impression handprint where they paint the hand, or ink it, if you will, and press it on the rock. Here they put the hand on the rock and spat the paint out around it. They do that, that, this type of handprint, we don't see too often in the Grand Canyon, but we see it a lot in the Southwest, a lot, like Canyon de Chez and places like that. But this type of handprint is quite frequent in Paleolithic art of France, Spain, and Germany, and so forth. So it's, it's an old form of making a hand pressure. 
almost we're almost there. The Virgin, which is one of the branches of ancestral Puebloan art, they made structures, and here's a, a Virgin uh, structure that's collapsed. The walls of this kiva have collapsed, or it looks like a, it could be a kiva. This happens to be an actual Puebloan sandal, a yucca fiber sandal that was found in the Grand Canyon and is now properly archived at the GRCA. There's a Puebloan basket or a little tray, if you will, beautifully rendered. And there's some of the art. And you can see that there's some differences. Some people might say those look like clan symbols or they have some interpretive spin on it, but we don't know. But what we do know, this looks like a bow and arrow shooting at something that looks like from Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> There's a close-up. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. yeah. Now that gives us an idea of some possible temporal uh, placement of where this could occur after the introduction of the uh, bow and arrow. If you read Yohi or anybody, there's different dates where they believe this was introduced as it phased into Southern California. Here's a white motif. Now remember, I told you white is the most fugitive of the paints. In other words, it weathers away more quickly than the others, but this is well protected. Well, I'm going to use well protected in quotes, unfortunately. Here's looking at it a little bit more formally. A beautiful procession of sheep and an anthropomorph with some sort of bar in its hand. But that's the whole panel of what I was just showing you. And can you see that's a large pyramidal shape of rock that looks like it's cracking away? We've been monitoring that every year I go out and measure this. And it has th that gap has increased about 1.1 centimeters in the last decade. Not too, far not too far away, there is a flagstone quarry. There's a lot of heavy, you know, percussive impact, and we're worried about this dehissing. I have, my heart's going to be broken if I go there and it crashes, because it will pulverize and disintegrate if it hits the ground. But that's just the nature of these things over time, geologically. There's a, oh, the virgin were very known for stacking human beings. Like they're boom, boom, boom. And almost, kind of reminds me of a totem pole or something like that. Lastly, and this will be the last one I share with you because I have seven minutes, the Cayenta. The Cayenta. They were on the southern, the south of the Colorado River, and they were kind of, they would co-mingle with the Kohanina from time to time, actually even cohabitate archaeological, recent uh, archaeological reports have suggested they find both of them in cohabitation uh, situations. And there's an example of a petroglyph, one of my favorite, by the way, um, of the uh, Cayenta. They built structures, cliff dwellings, there's rock art inside that cliff dwelling and all around. You can see I'm walking around it while my friend's son is wishing his iPhone was getting reception. <laughs> <laughs> Looking up, you can see art on the bottom. Yeah, he was stressed out. <laughs> Wasn't getting his fix. Um, and here's interesting. Here we have a Cayenta Puebloan structure overlapping the uh, art itself. So we get a sense, oh, when that art was, that art, that art is antecedent to the mudding of this particular dwelling. So we get age from the dwelling because there's little plant fragments in the, in the dwelling and we can get a, you know, a threshold date for that rock art, which is kind of interesting. There's that one, there's a whole panel that I showed you. I showed you a component of it earlier. It's quite magnificent. I must say that this panel has now been made accessible by the, the Grand Canyon and BLM because so many people were visiting it that they had to make a decision. You know, we can't keep pretending that people don't know where it is. And so they created a little parking lot and an actual walkway. But it was clever that they did this. Now people have access. Now I'm hoping they don't 
do nefarious things to the panel. But the problem is, as people were accessing it, they unwittingly were walking right through a large village site and destroying it. Oh. And so you're, it's these catch-22 decisions that these land managers, it's not easy. And the cat is out in the bag, thanks to those silly uh, phones that I mentioned earlier, that people are finding their way to this stuff, and they don't have a responsible attitude. So what are we going to do? Close up. Look at that two-headed snake. How many of you have a spiral and two-headed snake at home? <laughs> okay. Yeah, a snail, right? Just now, one my last last part, I'll, and I'll end on this. One of the joys is being able to record this in perpetuity, quote unquote. We hope for both our Native American partners and the Grand Canyon and all the land managers. As I said, we're up to 542 sites now, and we've done absolute thorough recording, both the archaeology, the paint, the paintings, and everything, and that's in their repositories for future reference. Also, we use as high definition as we can. I'm currently shooting with a, a Sony AR7 III, which is 42 megabytes. I mean, we make huge files because we, we hope that this information gets to be shared generation to generation. But part of the fun is also discovering new things. And in the, the preface of the book, we talk about Don and I were out, we were lost. We were walking along the edge of the plateau. And I told Don, I go, Don, I, I, I'm, I, I joke with him. I go, my spidey senses. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and I don't even care for cartoon movies. But anyway, I just said my, my spidey sense. And he goes, what? And I go, I think we're on an ancient trail. He goes, no, we're on an elk trail. I go, no, no, no. This is not an elk trail. And we were going back and forth, and he's the veteran. He's the experienced one. And I'm going, Don, I'm telling you, this is a Native American trail because it has its purposeful nature and so forth. It's following contour lines, and animals don't do that. They zip up and down. So Don turns the corner right here. And, he, and then I, 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 I go, what do, you, what do you see, Don? He goes, oh, my God. There's Don. We reenacted it. <laughs> and we, he saw all these paintings, which have never been noted by any archaeologist. Yeah, and we've had several of these, but this is the one I wanted to show. And the paint was so thick. Look at the polychromatic paint. And it's so thick, and of course my chemistry is going, eh, nah, 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 that could be dated. But anyway, and just really abstract, and it was almost like it was just done. I'm showing you, there, it's, fry, it's friable because the, the, this, the limestone is, is you know, parting ways, the sandstone rather. But what's interesting is this find led to the National Park, or National Forest archaeologist Neil Weintraub to go out there and see what we had seen. <coughs> And then he discovered a gigantic, and I mean gigantic, Cayenta village, which is now being studied and is starting to connect the Cojonino with the Cayenta. So, in other words, our little serendipitous discovery, and by the way, we call the site serendipity, <laughs> um, has led to a gigantic archaeological project that will go on for another decade or so because the site is huge. It is the largest one they've found. So it's kind of fun to also contribute to the little domino that leads to another study and that leads to another study, and that feels good. Um, this timeline, I didn't get into the historic stuff, but that's <coughs> recent. Um, am, am I stopping at a good time? Where's, yeah. my, where's my boss? Okay. Uh, anyway, it was a joy to present to you, and I particularly appreciate your, your interest and your curiosity. And uh, that's and I continue to do this to this very day. I'll be out in the Grand Canyon maybe three or four times this summer, running down new leads, adding to the knowledge set for the land managers. We don't advertise these sites. We give them to the responsible parties. And that keeps us feeling good about the ethics of what we do. All I can say is if you get an opportunity, if you get lucky and you run across something, which you can do that in Southern California. Um, be sure that you don't.
don't spread it on Facebook, especially our younger folks. Um, talk to the Native American community, talk to the folks at Pachanga, or talk to an archaeologist, and give that information the repository that it requires. Because we have to be, our responsibility index has been rising because of the media age. But if you'd like to talk to me more about this, I'd love to talk to you. If you're interested in my book, that's fine. Uh, I'm not here to hawk books, but uh, those are the notes to the lecture. You know? <laughs> Thank you so much for your kind attention. Any questions?